Turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 1 today, and incidentally, just while you're, you're turning there, just backing up a little bit to Pastora's question, it's interesting, Pastor, in that verse in John's Gospel, in 1 Corinthians also, it says there about the husband is sanctified. Now, this is where we need to know our theology. If it had said is justified, we definitely would have been in trouble. Because the word justified means given a correct standing before God and somebody saved. Mm. But the word sanctified means holy. So it definitely means that as a wife lives a holy life, ho hopefully that holy experience and that testimony will have some effect on her unbelieving husband. So it doesn't actually say that man is saved, otherwise the word would have been justified. It says sanctified. In other words, he's coming under the effect of the holy living of the wife. So I think that's really, uh, really, really important. So, uh, so the, those words, those theological words, are pretty important for interpretation. Hopefully that's helpful anyway, Pastora. Okay. And so this morning, I'd like us to think about the Apostle Paul. And what I'd like us to do this morning is to put a stethoscope on the Apostle Paul's heart and find out exactly how he was beating. You know, if you have heart trouble, one of the men I was out on the streets with yesterday, he's just been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, which is something some older people get as they get older, and it means that the top two chambers of the heart are beating irregularly, and because of that, he's having to go on to warfarin, because when your top two chambers of the heart beat irregularly, sometimes that can cause blood clots, and cause strokes, so he's been put on some blood thinning tablets to help that. And so he's developed a heart problem. Now it's possible, of course, that all of us as Christians could develop a heart problem, not necessarily a physical one, but a spiritual one. So it's really interesting to see how Paul's heart was working. And really Paul's heart, you know, we, we wonder why it appears that he was so successful. That's not really the right word, but why God greatly used him, which of course he did. He had a great ministry, wrote 14 of the New Testament books. Why was that? Well, it all boils down as to all what the Christian life boils down to. It's our heart condition, isn't it? If our heart is right, and if we're fertile ground and good ground, God can really use us. If there's some idiosyncrasies which need to be dealt with, well, we need to allow God to do that so that we can grow and move on. None of us are perfect in this area, and Paul would never have claimed to be perfect. But it is interesting to see how Paul's heart was definitely something which God was able to use and drive him forward in his ministry. And as I was preparing this message, I had to pray, Lord, I really desire a heart like this. Because I recognise that I fell far short in some of these areas. And if we're honest this morning, we all do. And Paul hadn't made it. It wasn't utopia. But nevertheless, he was moving to the mark where God could really use him. So this morning we're going to have a look at Paul's heart condition, which resulted in God being able to use him in such a major extent. And the first thing I'd like us to look at here this morning in Philippians chapter 1 is verse number three. Now remember Paul wrote this church, this uh, book to the church at Philippi. And uh, Philippi, of course, was uh, a church which was moving forward, unlike the church at Corinth, which we mentioned in the question time. That was just a mess. But this church was moving forward. And in Philippians chapter one and verse number three here, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So he wrote this letter to these dear Christians at Philippi and he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And the first thing this tells me about Paul's heart is that Paul had a heart of full appreciation of other believers. This is really important. He really appreciated other believers. Other believers had touched his heart so much that he constantly remembered them and he constantly prayed for them. That's an important aspect. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And it's really important that we should allow God to develop a heart like that in us. We really need to love one another. 
That instruction is in the Bible. We really need to appreciate one another. So have a look here in Romans chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and we will be moving around a little bit this morning. But as Paul writes now to the church at Rome, rather than the church at Philippi, which we were looking at, Romans 1, verse 8 and 9, he says here about them, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now this is really significant. You see, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, he said, I remember you, and I pray for you. And when he wrote to the church at Rome, he's saying, I'm thanking, I'm thanking God for you, I'm thanking God for your faith, and I'm without ceasing mentioning you in my prayers. Now, if Paul couldn't care less about these people, he wouldn't have said that. But the fact of the matter is, he had a real appreciation for these people. And folks, throughout the Bible, we learn that the Christian community, compared with the whole world population, which currently is about 7 billion people, the Christian community is pretty small. You know, I was talking to a man on the street yesterday, and in some parts of the world, the Christian community, Christians are becoming an extinct species. <laughs> There's not so many Christians in some parts of the world as maybe there used to be. And the fact is, Paul said that you and I should be precious to one another. We should appreciate one another. And we're not perfect, but nevertheless, this is the nearest we're going to get to heaven this side of eternity mm. with a relationship with other Christians as we have a relationship with Jesus. And so the first thing is absolutely obvious that Paul had a real appreciation of other believers. He didn't take them for granted or use them for his own uh, uh, perhaps moving up the ladder, you know, like you get in commercial circumstances. He genuinely loved them and appreciated them. Now, remember in the Bible, we're never called to like people. Jesus never commanded us to like people. And let's face it, because we're all different and we have different characteristics, it isn't always possible to like people, but it is possible to go the extra mile and love people and at least be courteous to them and put them before you. And I, I honestly believe that's one of the reasons why Paul had uh, a great ministry. And of course, Jesus is the, the wonderful example of that, isn't he? There he was, dying on the cross. And you know, Jesus, there were seven signs on the cross. And one of them was, as he was being crucified, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that was a real extent and uh, uh, exhibition of God's love and an appreciation of others. So Jesus put himself secondary to other people. And so the first thing to learn about Paul's heart was he had a full appreciation of other believers. Let's, let's pray that we can do also. The second thing about Paul was not only did he have an appreciation of other believers, he had a genuine concern for others. In other words, uh, in Paul's day, uh, I know he wouldn't be able to pick up the telephone to ask the believer how they were, but nevertheless in some way he would communicate with them. He would ask them, how are you doing? You know, I heard you had a tough week. I want to ring up and I want to encourage you. Have a look at Romans 9 and verse number 3. It's all about interpersonal relationships, isn't it? Uh, in the Christian community. Romans chapter 9 uh, and verse number 1 to 3. Notice this. Romans 9 verse 1 to 3. And Paul says here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continued <coughs> sorrow in my heart for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now that's an amazing statement. You may remember in the Old Testament Moses said to God, you can kill me God so that the rest of my Jewish brothers and sisters can live. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in a roundabout way here. He's saying, Lord, I'm so concerned about my brothers and sisters that they either get saved or get closer to you, that you can curse me if that would assist in them growing up and becoming either better believers or believers as we understand it, trusting Christ. So there was a great concern for other people. Have a look here in Exodus chapter 32. 
and verse number 32. Exodus 32 and verse number 32. Moses had the same heart, and it's all a question of our heart, and that's proportional to how much God will use us. Mo um, Exodus 32, and look, look at verse 31. And the Bible says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Notice this. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And so again, he was prepared to die, so that his friends could be forgiven and grow. Now this is a real heart. It takes some, some, uh, some developing in the Christian walk to develop a heart like that. It's really saying that my interests are secondary to other people's interests, my brother's and sister's interests, because we have a natural propensity as humans for the whole universe to revolve around us. And that can develop a really selfish nature. But you see, Paul didn't have that selfish nature. He appreciated other believers. He had a genuine concern for other believers. And this was important to him. Have a look at the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 18 and verse number 33. 2 Samuel, chapter 18 and verse number uh, 33, if you would. Uh, and this, of course, is a, a case of growing in, in wisdom and stature. But 2 Samuel... 18 and verse number 33. And the Bible says there, And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh Absalom, my son, my son. And there was David. And of course he was being pursued by Absalom, his son. Absalom, his son, wanted to kill his father. And yet David says, my son, my son, if God could kill me and you could live, well, I'd be happy about that. Now, that takes a lot of self-sacrifice. And so Moses sacrificed in this way. Paul did, having a concern for others. And so did David for his son, who, of course, had offended him so much. And so Paul had an appreciation for others, a concern for others, but also Paul was absolutely determined that he wouldn't offend his brothers and sisters in any way. And it's very easy, and we spoke about that in the new notice here in the church, very easy sometimes for us to offend people. And it's not a good thing, and Paul was determined not to do that. Have a look at this characteristic, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse number 13. And so he was, he was looking out for others. He wasn't deliberately going to drive a bulldozer over what they'd done and what they thought. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse number 13. Let's read verse number 12. Paul says there, But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will not eat no flesh, while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. So here was a situation where there were some Christians up comment, for some reason didn't eat me. And Paul moves into the situation, and he didn't come along and he didn't bash them over the head with a sledgehammer. He said, well, if they're not going to eat meat, and they've invited me around for dinner, you know what, folks, I'm not going to eat meat either. Because I'm not going to offend them. Because it's a peripheral thing. It's not really important. I don't understand why people don't eat beef burgers. I love beef burgers. But if they choose not to eat beef burgers and just eat lettuce, well, that's fine. I'm not going to hurt them because of that. That's their individual choice. It's not going to make any difference to whether they go to heaven or not. Uh, and so Paul was determined not to offend people. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 12. And so sometimes we can get so hung up on these stupid things you know, there's all often, um, often lots of arguments over whether ladies should wear trousers or not. But, I mean, it's a completely irrelevant argument. What's important is whether that person is growing more like Christ. It's not important to keep hammering away at these issues. And Paul didn't want to offend people over stupid things. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 12. And Paul says here, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And so 
Paul is saying, major on the majors and don't major on the minors. Yeah. Because if you major on the minors, that's where the troubles can be and that's where you can offend people. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 9 and verse number 20. And it's interesting that there's, there's three, four verses in the book of 1 Corinthians all to do with this same subject. And of course the problem was, as I said, the church of Corinth was the most immature New Testament church. And they would argue about these things which actually weren't important at all. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 9. And verse number 20, and Paul says there, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So Paul says, when I'm with a Jew, well, I'm not going to offend them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to appreciate them. And I'm going to be concerned for them. Look at 1 Corinthians 9 and verse number 22. To the weak became I as weak that I may gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. He wasn't saying there that he was getting involved in their sin, but what he was saying was, some people's practices may be a little different to our practice, but we don't destroy them or offend them. We try to win them and help them in their Christian walk. So Paul didn't want to deliberately offend people. He made the stand for things which were obviously against the scriptures, but just because some people ate differently, or dressed a little differently, or perhaps cut their hair to the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side, this wasn't going to be something which Paul was going to use to cause trouble. Our job is to edify and encourage people, isn't it? And so it's really important. Now, something else about Paul was, he wasn't a know-it-all. He wasn't a night all I remember when I was in the electronics trade, I used to go to uh, different seminars by manufacturers like Hitachi and Mitsubishi and Sony. And whenever I went to some of those courses, you know, I felt so small because there was always somebody there who knew all the answers. There was always some big head somewhere along the line, you know, who knew everything. And uh, although I remember those days, I now remember that I must never be like that as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And Paul never was like that as a Christian. He had a humble heart. Look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, and, and, and verse number 8. He was prepared to admit his shortcomings. It's really important for us to admit our shortcomings. Ephesians 3, and verse number 8. Look what Paul says here. Now remember, Paul had a, a massive mind. He was trained under Gamaliel. And uh, perhaps he, he could well have been one of the most intelligent Jewish people who ever lived. The Bible said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and yet he never used that great intellect to hammer other people down or to make them look small. Ephesians 3 and verse number 8, and the Bible says there, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What an amazing statement that is in verse number 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all the saints. In other words, I put myself at the bottom of the barrel compared with other saints. Have a look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 15. 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 15. These were the, the heart conditions which God chose to use in the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 15. And Paul says that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now that shows humility, folks. He says he's the least of all the saints. And he didn't have to be because he was really the most intelligent. And then he says... I'm the chief of all sinners. So he wasn't, point, he wasn't one of these people who would point over there and say, look at Mrs. Bloggs, what she's involved in, or Mr. Smith over here, look at what a terrible sinner he is. He would say, no, I'm the worst of them all. I'm the chief of sinners. That takes some humility, folks. And when you have a heart like that, God's going to use you. you know? It means you're not going to be a Pharisee. It means you're not going to be judgmental toward everybody else. It's such an important thing. So if we want to be used by God, we've got to have an appreciation of other believers. We've got to be concerned for others. We've got to make sure we don't deliberately offend people when it isn't necessary. 
and we have to have a humble heart. And we also have to be a servant. Every Christian should be a servant. Christ was a great example of that. And Paul recognized that he was a servant. Have a look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1. We, we have to have a servant's heart that we're prepared to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is mentioned several times about Paul in the Scriptures, Romans 1 and verse number 1, but also, of course, about Christ. Uh, the Bible says several times he's a servant for us. And it says here in one, Romans 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And the servant means exactly that, serving others. The word servant in the Bible means minister. Minister, And whenever you read the word minister in the Bible, you know that means a servant. So Pastor Jonathan, for example, although he's a minister of the gospel, he's a servant. He's a servant. He's there to serve you as God's people. And we all need that, that servant heart. But even though Paul had all these wonderful heart characteristics, he wasn't a compromiser. You know, sometimes people think, well, if you go down that road where you appreciate others, you concern yourself about others, you don't offend others, you're humble, you're a servant, that means you're going to be a doormat as a Christian. But actually, there's a strange paradox there because you think about Jesus, you know, uh, and the way he was a servant and died for us, but he wasn't a doormat. He stood up for what was right, and that's really important. And so did Paul. Paul had a heart which was bold despite all these other characteristics which were correct. Have a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse number 2. He, he was bold in what he believed. He stood for what he believed, but he dealt with that boldness and used that boldness in the right way. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, and verse number 2 here, it says here, let's read verse number 1 of 1 Thessalonians 2. It says there, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So here he is, a humble man, a love for every other saint, and yet there came a point where he would still be bold in the gospel and he'd get into lots of disputes and debates about the gospel and he wasn't going back away from that. And so you see there's strength in humility. The strongest people in our world today are people who are a servant and humble. It's a paradox. You don't think of that, you know. The world thinks, oh well, you have to really be at rung number one on the top of the ladder to be a strong person. But as a Christian, well, we can be on the bottom rung and we can still be more powerful than the person at the top of the ladder. That's the thought there. And Paul proved that. And so he was bold in the gospel. And he wasn't just bold in the gospel. He was confident in that which he was proclaiming. Have a look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 3. So he had a confident heart. Philippians 4 and verse number 13. And so all of these things were coming together as a heart of humility, yet a heart of strength. He was as bold as a lion. Here in Philippians 4 and verse number 13, we see he's confident, you know. Uh, the world says to this verse, I can do all things through my own brains and ability. But Paul says here in Philippians 4 and verse number 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so there was a boldness there. He recognized that nothing was impossible for God, and he could do anything providing he kept his heart right in the previous points. And God could really use him. So he was confident. Have a look at Acts 28 and verse number 31. Acts 28 and verse number 31. And the Bible says there, the very last verse of the book of Acts, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And so, as I say, there was a paradox here, that he was strong, and yet he was weak. And remember, the Bible says elsewhere, when we're weak, then we're strong as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And that's how it works, but only if we have a heart like Paul had. 
But not only was he confident, Paul was a man who, who set goals for himself. This is really important. Now, for those of you in the working world, somewhere in your office you're going to have a chart on the wall and it's going to have company mission statement or there's going to be a graph there which says how well you've done over the past year and if you're not doing that well, you're going to have a pay cut. Maybe if you're doing well, you're going to have a pay rise. All companies in the commercial world, they have, they have mission statements and goals set. Now, even in the Christian life, we should set goals because if we don't set goals, we're going to become stagnant. If we're not moving forward, we're going to be moving backwards. Or, well, we may even be standing still. So, right, you can imagine that every morning, Paul woke up and he thought to himself, well, I'm going to pray, I'm going to seek the Lord, and I'm not going to waste this day. Because once this day has gone, I'm never going to be granted it again. So he set goals, and he didn't waste it. You know, he didn't put his feet up in front of the television or spend six hours on the internet. He, he, he was going to set goals for his ministry. Have a look at Romans chapter 15, and verse 24 to 25. Romans 15 and verse 24 and 25. And you can imagine, as I said, when I was preparing this message, I realised I've got a long way to go, folks, but I'm just sharing the gospel this morning. So here in Romans 15, verse 24 and 25, let's read from, yeah, verse 24. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. He set a target. He wanted to go to Spain to see the believers, but he was also going to go to Jerusalem. Now he could have woke up and said, well I'm going to have a day off today. I'm going to have a rest. I'm going to Tenerife for a fortnight, you know. But no, he had a constant goal. And he said, today I'm going to Jerusalem to minister, to be a servant unto the saints. Let's have a goal, folks. You know, we can achieve a lot more time if we have a goal. Now, for somebody like myself who's self-employed, so there's not big brother breathing down my neck every day, it would be very easy for me to get out of schedule and out of kilter. And I've discussed this with many preachers, you know. It would be very easy for me to maybe get out of bed an hour later and perhaps waste the morning. But I set goals many years ago, like this morning, I always get up at quarter past five on a Sunday morning, and that's the time I was up this morning, and I had a good time with the Lord. It was a good time with the Lord. It was a goal, you see. And I've always been completely convinced, and we'll see in a moment that Paul was also very disciplined, that a disciplined, scheduled life is a life which achieves something. It's really, really important. And so Paul set these goals. I'm not going to waste today. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And I'm going to minister to the saints. I'm not going to waste tomorrow. I'm going to visit that sick person and be an encouragement to them. I'm going to fill my schedule. Not that I'm too busy, but I'm going to fill my schedule so I can be effective. And Paul was very, very much like that. Now, amongst all of these things and the difficulties he had, he was also absolutely determined. He had a heart which said, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, there's a t-shirt which I've seen very frequently in Corby and Peterborough. People wandering around and it's got, just do it, you know. Now, there's all sorts of connotations for that. But that's a good motto in the way of the being a Christian, isn't it? We need to be determined and just to do it. There's often days like yesterday morning I wasn't feeling very well and I didn't really want to go into the town centre at Corby. But I knew, I said to Rosen, I've just got to do it. And it's amazing when you step out and just do it, how much God sustains you and bless you. And Paul was determined like they had a determined heart for the things of God. Have a look at Acts chapter 14 and verse number 19 and 20. And the Bible says here, Acts, now you couldn't have anybody more determined than Paul. You look at this, Acts 14 and verse number 19 and 20. And the Bible says there, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed from Barnabas to Derby. Now, that's, that's some determination, folks. He was stoned almost to death in verse number 19. 
And the Bible doesn't say he went into hospital for 10 months. It says in verse number 20 that he rose up, trusting God, and the very next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. That's determination. You know, if you or I had been stunned, we probably would have given up for a few months. But no, Paul was determined to carry on, whatever the consequences. That's a good heart to have as a Christian, isn't it? He was, he was persistent, wasn't he? Have a look at Acts 28 again, and verse number 30 to 31. He was persistent and determined. And the Bible says here, in verse number 30 of Acts 28, And Paul dwelt two years. Here he was now in Rome. And he dwelt there two whole years. Verse number 30 of Acts 28. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. And he saw a door that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. So in Acts 14, he was determined to get up from the very jaws of death and carry on. And here he was in prison for two years and he said, well, I'm going to make the best of this and I'm going to continue preaching the gospel because people need to hear about it. There was a determination there, wasn't there? And a persistence about him. But in the middle of all of these things, Paul was fundamentally joyful. In fact, he wrote the whole book of Philippians, and you can understand the number, you can underline the number of times where joy and joyful occurs. And so, when you're stoned, you can still be joyful, Paul's saying. When you get opposition, you can still be joyful, Paul's saying. Let's maintain a joy. Nehemiah said, didn't he, the joy of the Lord is my strength despite all the aggro. And we're all going to have lots of aggro this week. We can still rejoice and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. Come what may. Have a look at um, Romans 15 and verse number 32. This is the sort of heart that God was really able to use as he saw it developing in Paul. Romans 15 and verse number 32. And Paul says here, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Isn't that great? And so he was joyful. So what we learned so far, he appreciated other believers, he had a genuine concern for others, he didn't want to deliberately offend people, he was humble, he was a servant, but despite all of that humility, he was strong and he was bold and he was confident in Christ. He set goals, he didn't waste time, he recognized it was precious. That's why in the book of Ephesians he, put there, he, re he wrote there, redeeming the time for the days thereof are evil. He was determined, he was persistent, and one of the things which I think was a real key concerning Paul's heart and his moving forward is that this man was completely satisfied. He was content. You know one of the reasons why so often we're not as we should be as a Christian? It's because we're not content. Whereas Paul was absolutely content in his life. He was satisfied. That was his heart condition. Have a look at Philippians 4 and verse number 11. Philippians 4 and verse number 11. It, it's, it's a real problem when Christians are always haggling or hanging after other things. Or, I want this, I want that. This situation needs to be altered. But God says whatever situation you're in, you can be satisfied if you commit it to Him and allow Him to work it out. It's a terrible thing where you're never satisfied. You know, the Israelites murmured when you read the book of Numbers and you can underline the number of times the word murmured occurred there. They were constantly murmuring and moaning and complaining against God for the circumstances. But what a joy it is, what a peace it is to be content and to be satisfied. Have a look at Philippians 4 and verse number 11. Paul says here, not that I speak in respect to want, for I have learned in whatsoever, that covers everything you see, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know, both how, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Isn't that great? So whatsoever state I am, I can be content. If you're not a Christian, you can't be content. But if you are a Christian, you can be content. So if you have a penny in the bank or a million pounds in the bank, you can be satisfied. If your marriage is a bit rocky, well, don't give up on it. Continue in it.
because you can be content and God will work it out as you both entrust him to do so. You can still be content. I tell you the number of people I've seen uh, over the years, and 35 years this year I've been a Christian in November, and the number of marriages I've seen on the rocks, that when we've been able to move in and counsel people from the Bible, boy, there's nearly the same amount of marriages which have been rescued, and now those people are content. Because both partners have said, I'm going to give this situation to God, both partners have admitted to each other that they've made a mess of things, and both partners have agreed before God, we're going to get it right anyway, because we know that's good for us, and it's best for God, and it's going to bring in glory, and it's better for the kids as well. And so, you see, if you're in a dodgy marriage, you can be content in due course. It may take a bit of time, but it can work out. If you've got nothing in the bank, don't worry, you've got Jesus. That's all you need. All you need is Jesus, isn't it? You know, the Beatles sung in 1967. Some of you remember that. All you need is love. Well, it, we don't need the sort of love necessarily that they were talking about. But all we actually need is to recognise, experience and know the love of God. And we're on a winner, folks. Mm. And Paul says, I'm in this jail, whereby he wrote the book of Philippians from. His only friends were the rats and probably his only food was dry bread. He said, I'm still going to be joyful. And folks, even though I only have daylight one hour a day, I'm still going to be content, he said. I'm still going to praise the Lord. Isn't it amazing how God can work out impossible situations? So he was satisfied with what he had. And we've already seen that he was disciplined. We know elsewhere he brought his body under subjection. But the final thing I want you to notice is, Paul was always optimistic. You know, I do not like being around negative people. If you're around negative people for too long, it ain't going to be very long before you become a negative person. I like being around positive people. And as Christians, we can be positive. This isn't some sand fairy Anne, you know, a needle in a haystack type of thing. To be a Christian is positive, isn't it? Paul was a positive thinker, but he was thinking about the right things. And he was optimistic. Have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7 and verse number 8. It's difficult to be optimistic, I'm sure, when you're nearly stoned to death, but Paul was. It's difficult to be optimistic, I'm sure, when you're in a Roman dungeon for two years, yet Paul was. And have a look here in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. And Paul says here, uh, let's read verse number 6 here. He says, For I am now ready, 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So Paul was constantly looking to the future. He was looking ahead. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12, aren't we, that, that Jesus endured the cross by looking beyond the cross to the joy which was laid up for him. So whatever circumstance we are in, we can still be optimistic. Christians should be one the happiest people in the world, and two, the most optimistic people in the world. We have nothing to concern ourselves about because we know, as Paul says, there's laid up for us the crown of righteousness in heaven. Folks, in 50 years' time, probably none of us sitting in this auditorium today are going to be here. Jackie might because she's still a young lady, but, but the majority of us are not going, well Hannah will be of course, yeah. but, the, but as regards adults, in 50 years time if we're realistic, probably none of us really are going to be here if we're honest. So what is the point in offending people over what they eat or how they dress, you know? It's pointless, isn't it? It's absolutely stupid. What is the point in arguing as a married couple endlessly when God says, I've got the cure, and if you follow me, I can make you content. What is the point in moaning that you've only got a penny in the bank? It's not worth it, is it? It's completely futile in the eyes of God. Why not just be satisfied? So we need to pray. I have to pray. Lord, give me a heart like Paul had. Well, I really appreciate my brothers and sisters. Well, I'm really concerned for them. 
where I'm not going to offend them over the stupid things, where I'm humble, a servant, but maintain boldness in the gospel. Give me a heart where I can continue to be confident in Christ and set goals and be determined and be persistent. And Lord, help me to be satisfied. And finally, Lord, despite it all, may I always be positive because I'm always a winner when I'm in Jesus. A few years ago when mobile phones came out, you may remember, and, and Orange were a, a company then, that I think they were one of the first mobile um, phone companies, they used to have adverts on the telly, and it used to say, the future is orange. I don't know whether you remember that. Uh, and I re used to think, what a stupid advert. My future is Jesus. That's where my op our, our optimism is, and that's where our optimism should be, shouldn't it? Despite all the difficulties, whatever difficulty you folks have here this morning, be optimistic, be positive, Paul was. Let's have a heart like him, and God will be able to use us more for the short time that we're left here. Thank you, Brother Rudy.